Chinese spies are trying to infiltrate the U.S., from universities to the FBI. A former FBI undercover agent reveals their operation. This is China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Ever hear of a honey trap? A honey trap is when a hostile foreign government uses, say, a beautiful woman to seduce someone. A politician, a businessman, a scientist. They might give her information that could pose a national security threat. Or she could just use the salacious encounter to blackmail him. And let's just say, Chinese leaders know a thing or two about honey. I sat down with former FBI operative Mark Ruskin, author of The Pretender, My Life Undercover for the FBI, to find out how Chinese agents are using honey traps and many other techniques to infiltrate the United States. Thanks for joining me today, Mark. Hey, it's my pleasure, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Well, so as a former FBI agent, what have you seen are some of the ways the Chinese Communist Party is trying to gain influence in the United States? Well, the, the Chinese intelligence services, along with other hostile intelligence services, exploit a number of vulnerabilities that exist in the United States. And a large, to a large extent, and this may be surprising to, to some of your viewers, but the majority of the uh, data that they seek is actually available through open sources. Much of it is available legally to anyone who takes the trouble to look for it. Is this what you mean by vulnerabilities? Yeah, by vulnerabilities, I'm talking about open uh, manners in which uh, data, which can be of use to a hostile power such as China, can be accessed without necessarily violating any federal or American laws. Mm -hmm. A lot of the data that is significant and can be used for a hostile adversary purposes is actually available through open sources. Much of it is information, for example, such as uh, technical reports, research, engineering, which has been conducted on a very sophisticated level and has not yet been classified. So there's often a lag time, for example, with, where, with advanced research, the publication of the research not being reviewed and being ultimately classified as secret or top secret, but since the uh, Chinese intelligence services are very active and, and on the ball and alert, often they've already accessed the information and it's at, uh, it's at the door prior to it being classified. Well, so what might China do with this information? Well, we're talking, I, I'm thinking basically information of a technical level, which can then be used by their own engineers and their own uh, researchers to uh, to advance their own uh, uh, level of sophistication, bypassing the research that they would have had to do themselves in order to reach the same point. And in other words, uh, they're taking advantage. And this is a problem uh, w with uh, academia in the United States in that we have a very open society. And by uh, uh, having this kind of openness, it gives uh, more access to hostile services to uh, obtain information either you know, through a variety of, of methods, but often not necessarily uh, through espionage, but often it's simply by being alert and being quick and accessing the, and knowing where to look and, and, and when to look. So that's kind of similar to how recently it came out that the chair of Harvard's chemistry department was getting uh, funding from China. Right. Just, uh, just last month, just at the, at the end of January, there was an, uh, an arrest of uh, Professor Lieber and uh, announcements by the uh, special agent in charge of the FBI in Boston, Bonaventura, who uh, ec he explained in his uh, statements that right now uh, China is, in his view, and uh, uh, presumably reflects the view of the FBI today, China is the largest intelligence threat to the U.S. You know, whether uh, you know, it's larger than, than Russia or, or not, it's, it's kind of like a, how many uh, angels can dance on the head of a pin type of question. Mm -hmm. In either case, they're all hostile intelligence services and need to be, we need to take uh, preventative uh, counterintelligence type measures in order to protect 
the ourselves from from uh, hostile acts. Well, so you've talked about how China takes advantage of open source information, how in the case of the uh, Harvard professor Lieber, uh, how money can buy off people. How does China use foreign agents in the United States? Well, historically, there have been a number of ways that the uh, Chinese have used traditional espionage techniques. One in particular uh, that's been very successful is, uh, and it, 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 you know, it may seem reminiscent of uh, John le Carré novels, but it's, uh, the reality is, is what's referred to in tradecraft as a you know, honey trap, mm. which is using an attractive female uh, a case officer, an intelligence officer, to uh, uh, develop a relationship with someone who has access to classified information and to, uh, it's a, it's a long-term proposition to develop the rela uh, an intimate, ultimately physical relationship, or may maybe even a relationship that the uh, target believes is a, a legitimate emotional relationship. There was a, 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 an FBI agent, uh, uh, a supervisor, James, and his last name escapes me right now, but uh, who, with uh, Cassandra Leung, was the uh, name of the uh, intelligence officer, you know, not her, her real uh, Mandarin name, uh, but she, she developed a relationship with him, and for 20 years, that relationship con continued. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine, for nearly two decades, and he was the supervisor of a China counterintelligence squad uh, in the FBI's Los Angeles office. And he was taking, apparently, uh, uh, from what uh, I understand, confidential classified documents to his uh, uh, rendezvous with her. So uh, until ultimately he was arrested uh, after he retired and entered into a plea agreement with the uh, US Attorney's office. Uh, how common are these honey traps? The, unfortunately, it's a question that has no real answer because we, all we know about is the ones that were caught, mm. right? Uh, so, from time to time, the, you know, in the FBI, it's not very common that we know about. You know, the first one in the history of the FBI involved an agent called Richard Miller, who was uh, seduced by a, a, a Soviet at that time, Soviet Union. Uh, uh, agent uh, whose name was Svetlana Agolonvenka. And uh, so uh, how often does it happen in other agencies? I would suspect it happens more often in other agencies. The FBI has a pretty serious vetting process for recruiting agents, mm -hmm. and as, as the CIA, I, CIA does as well. But there are other areas where these honey traps could be used, and which are not uh, to infiltrate America's counterintelligence services, but, all, but simply to infiltrate, say, academia. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have this kind of, of uh, technique being utilized with uh, college professors or, or uh, engineers working at nu nuclear research laboratories, which we wouldn't know about because they haven't come to surface yet. So besides these methods, what other tactics is the Chinese Communist Party using in the United States? I guess the one answer would be whatever they can mm -hmm. imagine and come up with. We, as we all know, the Russians, the Soviets were, since the creation of the Soviet Union, has been attempting to influence the American elections. Mm -hmm. With regard to the Russians, we can read about it because since the fall of the Soviet Union, many ex-KGB officers who worked in the U.S. have been able to publish their memoirs. So you can go to the bookstore and buy Kalugin's book and see how they were in New York and in Washington doing their best through all types of clandestine activity to influence the elections. Now, presumably, if the Russians were doing it, the Chinese were doing it also. However, we don't have a bunch of ex-Chinese intelligence officers publishing their memoirs because I would imagine that their longevity uh, would be very uh, dim indeed were they to attempt to do so, as would the health of their family members, right, probably. So we, we don't know firsthand. But what we do know is what has been uncovered just through 
ordinary criminal investigation, then for that we can just look back to the uh, Clinton re-election campaign. In the Clinton re-election campaign, there was uh, Johnny Young and the uh, thousands and thousands of dollars that were being apparently allegedly contributed both directly to the Clinton re-election campaign and to the Dem Democratic National Committee. This is Bill Clinton and the Chinagate scandal in right. the 90s? And it, yeah, of course, it didn't become as much of a scandal, I would suggest, as it, it should have been, because it, according to reporting in the, in the media, there was direct links between the uh, People's Republic of China uh, military intelligence services and the recipients or the middlemen for that money going to the campaign. So you, know, you, you asked uh, uh, how other, what other techniques, you know, I would suggest that you know, contributing to a political uh, party and contributing to a president's re-election campaign, and it was, it's more than just mere suspicion, there were 22 convictions as a result of this. So was, this is another tactic. It was another, it's a tactic, and it, it's a tactic, you know, how successful is it? I can't evaluate it, but, if, but it's certainly a tactic that, uh, arguably was used in order to influence uh, the outcome of an American political presidential election, and uh, also arguably inference can be made that there's a certain amount of influence that's being purchased through that kind of uh, donation. So it seems like the Chinese Communist Party is taking advantage of the free and open society we have in the United States. How can the U.S. counter this without giving up these freedoms? Well, there have been attempts. You know, the FBI, for example, many years ago, had an initiative that were, it was librarians were recruited. Since there's so much access to open source information, mm -hmm. the thought was that by bringing in librarians to identify suspect individual patrons, for, you know, and it, it, it may sound a little simple, but it, it could have been very effective. Uh, individuals with accents from countries which are known to be hostile to the U.S. Uh, accessing highly technical reports uh, uh, on a continuing basis. It was, it was thought, the idea was, and I think it was a good idea, that uh, it could, these could have provided leads in order to uh, identify, whether they be Chinese or Russian or from other hostile powers, individuals seeking to exploit open source information. Mm -hmm. The reaction from the librarians and from the uh, uh, civil liberties groups was hardly uh, very cooperative. It was just the opposite. There was a, 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 a big uh, negative reaction that caused the, uh, these, the initiative to essentially have to be shut down. It, there was a lot of publicity about it at the times in the at the time in the New York Times, but uh, ultimately it didn't work. A, a similar attempt occurred after 9/11, when the Patriot Act was passed. There was a clause that was referred to as the, as the Library Clause, in which again the FBI and other government agencies were seeking to obtain information regarding access by the Chinese and other hostile powers to uh, open source but uh, significant technological uh, information. Again, the reaction was hardly uh, cooperative. Uh, it, 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 it seems almost absurd, but there were signs being put in the library to warn patrons that their access may be subject to government uh, uh, review. So rather than cooperate, the, uh, it was just the opposite. The librarians were essentially warning off mm -hmm. uh, potential uh, patrons who could be uh, identified. So it's a tricky, it's a, it's, it's a balancing act. You know, we, we want well, to I was going to say, because yeah. I can kind of understand that, right. that fear, because in going after, China takes advantage of the open source information, but essentially the free and open access right. information right. in the United States. So if the government tries to stop that, it's almost like they're trying to stop free and open access to information, which is at the is one of the cores of our society. Right, and it's a core value, and and you know I would uh, argue that we want to maintain openness, we want to maintain our liberties. That's what makes this country 
uh, almost unique among other countries is our constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the privacy rights which we enjoy, or, albeit uh, some would argue, I would argue that many of the Bill of Rights provisions are being chipped away now, uh, unfortunately. But we do want to continue to enjoy them uh, best we can. And so it's a balancing act. To what extent do we maintain openness and at the same time protect uh, national security? And mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot has to involve uh, ethical uh, behavior by our counterintelligence services and our intelligence gathering services uh, and uh, pr regulations, legislation, which, which is designed or tailored to safeguard uh, our country and then at the same time safeguard uh, our liberties. So what are some of the ways the FBI is trying to counter Chinese espionage? operations? Or is that too classified? Well, I, I mean, I think the, 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 uh, the best way to, to address that is to just refer to the FBI's techniques in, in general to uh, counter the intelligence activities of hostile countries. And I, I would suggest that they're, they're not country-specific necessarily. So the, the techniques that the Bureau uses are to, you know, to fight Soviet, uh, that's not Soviet, but to fight uh, Russian intelligence activities or act, uh, Cuban intelligence activities or Chinese intelligence activities. Essentially, uh, to the, in, in an in a unclassified sense, are pretty much the same techniques. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, they may be, depending on the techniques being used by the hostile power, they may be fine tuning so that they Ad adapted to that particular country, but overall, it's not like it's a whole different bag of tricks for each different mm -hmm. country. You know, for example, you know, I worked a number of cases, and, and they're they're discussed in, in one uh, in some of the chapters in my book. As an undercover agent, I worked false flag operations. Mm -hmm. Now, false flag operations are directed against any number of hostile. Uh, type of, of, of uh, intelligence activities. And uh, th they're not country specific. So, but, and the way a false flag operation works essentially is, uh, just to, to briefly summarize, mm -hmm. the, uh, because I don't think that this is popular, you know, known to a large extent, is when an individual is identified who wants to sell or transfer classified information to another country's intelligence service. Mm -hmm. So it could be to China, it, to, to the Chinese intelligence, it could be to Russian intelligence. Exactly. But, but, but they're trying to sell, so the individual is identified, let's say uh, he is an, a nuclear engineer at a, at a facility that does research, that does classified research, or perhaps a, an army colonel mm -hmm. who uh, has access to classified military intelligence. Then, uh, he or she reaches out through some tech, perhaps let's say to a friend. Do you know anyone in X capital of X country who might be interested in buying this information? And the source then, instead of going to someone in that country, comes to the FBI and says, hey, do you know that you know, Professor so-and-so or Colonel so-and-so or engineer so-and-so mm -hmm. is seeking to sell secrets to wherever. Mm -hmm. And then the espionage unit at FBI headquarters would then reach out to me and say, Mark, you know, we need to tr you, know, you to, to reach out to this individual. And we'd, we'd very quickly set up an operation where I would pretend to be an intelligence officer working on behalf of that country. Uh, now, depending on the country, I could say that I'm either from that country or if it's obviously, it's obvious that I'm not from that country. I like could, China. Yeah, right. But I could be working for the intelligence service of another country on behalf, as a proxy, on behalf of China or wherever. And then, uh, say, well, you know, it's a hostile operating environment here, so they can't send somebody out, but they've asked my country to send out okay. someone in their stead, and I'm 
since you're, you're so important, and you know, stroking the individual, you're so important that they've sent me a very high level intelligence office in my country to make contact with you and establish a relationship. And these cases were very sensitive because, uh, and they needed someone who, and at, by this point I had a lot of experience doing this kind of work because the first contact was critical. If the individual, the future trader, didn't believe that I was who I was claiming to be, that would be the end, it would be shut down. There'd no, be no second chance, no second bite at the apple. So, so, so these were, and, but once they bit, then we would develop a whole clandestine system for them to transfer information to me. Mm -hmm. you know, something straight out of, a, again, of, of a John le Carré or Tom Clancy type thing with you know, dead drops and whatever to make them feel they were really working in a you know, clandestine activity. And then they would transfer, we would pay them, they would transfer, pay, I mean, that's what they wanted, if it was money, if it was, not, if it was ideological. But often, most of the time, there was money being paid. And then once they, you know, believing they were transferring information to a hostile power, it's actually us who's collecting it. And then at the end of the day, the handcuffs come on and they'd, uh, you know, usually uh, lengthy prison terms. Well, so what is the Chinese Communist Party's ultimate goal with these influence operations in the United States? Well, again, now you're calling, you know, for speculation as to what, what, uh, you, you know, the, I think that w when there's an attempt to influence an outcome of an election, you know, through whether through finances, uh, financial con contributions, or whatever, presumably uh, it's being done for a reason. I mean, l large quantities of money are not going to be uh, spent unless there's uh, some gain, that's, uh, some advantage that is expected to be obtained as a result of that. So. Yeah, I would suggest, I mean, again, and again, it's, it's spec speculation and opinion, but that they're seeking to obtain advantages and leverage in order to uh, expand whatever, their, whatever goals that their central committee has established, you know, be it uh, economic or otherwise. Thanks again for joining me today. No, it's a pleasure a having you on. My pleasure. Thank you